Yeah, I'm going to be recording. All right, it's going to be recording here for us. So uh, we can uh, have folks that are going to watch later. Or you don't need that. They're there on um, the, the most current one is there on our website. If you go to follow that YouTube page and watch the video there as well. So a uh, good morning, everybody. Good to be with you. We're going to be studying uh, Revelation chapters four and five today. This is our third session as we've gone through. Um, it's not as many verses as last week, but I think we're going to have a lot packed in in our conversation and our discussion today. I'm excited for that. So let's go ahead and open with the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of, of your son, Jesus Christ, who has risen and victorious and ascended to your right hand, who reigns in power over us and for us, who holds all things in his hands. We ask that uh, you would send your spirit into our hearts today to open them so that we would learn what you desire for us to know, so that we can be comforted, strengthened in our faith, uh, and encouraged on our mission for you. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. So um, we're going to jump right in today. And I realized I didn't get everything out that I needed to. So uh, if we can have somebody online willing to read for us um, Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, that would be great. I can do that, Pastor. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven and the first voice which i had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said come up here and i will show you what must take place after this at once i was in the spirit and behold throne stood in heaven one with one seated on the throne and he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald Clear, clear for everybody? We're good? <laughs> no? Okay. All right. Um, so uh, let's, let's unpack that a little bit. So after this, I looked. And so what John is talking about is after he had the vision of um, Jesus walking among the lampstands and the letters to the seven churches. So this, this, this is the next thing that John saw in his vision. Um, after this, I looked. And we get this picture of an opened door in heaven, right? And that's simply this. It's, it's a window, here literally a door, <laughs> into heaven. There is uh, an ancient thought, ancient cosmology as well as Jewish theology. There was this thought of the separation between earth and heaven. Um, sometimes that's referred to as the firmament, if you uh, remember those kinds of uh, things in, in Genesis. Um, not just a, a physical thing, but a, a physical kind of barrier or whatever else, but a, it was a, an actual barrier between heaven and earth. And so if you need to get through a barrier, what do you need? You need a door, all right? And so... Um, John sees a door open up in heaven, and it's a he's able to have a glimpse into the throne room of God. Um, special grace to look into heaven, which is ordinarily closed. We normally can't see that or be part of that. Um, and so it's an open door it means there this is a particular divine revelation. This is his first vision of heaven. So then uh, as we look there, there's a voice. And whose voice calls to him? A voice he heard before, the first voice that sounds like a trumpet, right? You can't ignore it. It, it fills the room. We know from earlier that was the one like the Son of Man, that is Jesus. So it's Jesus' voice again. If you have a red letter Bible, it cheats for you and lets you know that it's Jesus' voice because it's in red. Um, no, but it's a, a good, helpful, good tool for that. But that's Jesus' voice. Uh, we know that that's the voice of Jesus. Jesus says, Come. And I'll show you what must take place after this. Um, and John says, okay, I'm coming, Lord. You know, the Spirit has to take him up because he can't get there on his own. The Spirit takes him up into heaven. 
Um, and so this is probably a realm that most, if not all of us are unfamiliar with when we talk about visions. You know, that what's that like? What's that experience like? What's that mean? That's probably something that's not in our normal experience. But John is not the only one in scripture to have visions. So let's go and, and look at kind of Paul's recollection. Paul talks about having a vision. I'll go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. I'll go ahead and read that once I get there. Uh, this section of scripture, um, Paul is, is uh, facing people that are very proud and boastful of their past experiences and think that that gives them more standing or better standing before God and before others because of the things they've done or the things they've experiences, experienced. And so Paul in this section, he's been boasting about, well, if you want to play that game, we can play that game and I'm going to beat you. And I just want to show you how ridiculous this is. Um, is what Paul's doing. Um, and so he, he uh, is boasting here, not as the end of the game, but to show how ridiculous boasting is when it comes to Christ, because on our own, we have no standing, and Christ gives us standing. He's the one that does it for us. He says this, if I must go on boasting, I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ, all right, does that say, so this is, gets confusing. When he says that, he's like, I, I know a man in Christ talking about himself, okay? So don't get confused. He's talking about himself. I, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body. I don't know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body. I don't know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. Okay, so this is Paul's vision experience of heaven. Did Paul have this physically or spiritually or both? Paul doesn't even know, and he had the experience. So when we think about John, God knows, you're exactly right. John, did, was this a spiritual only experience or physical and spiritual experience? I don't know. God knows. He's in the spirit, just like Paul was in the spirit in this vision. Just as we think about that, where they, they were both lucid. They weren't in a dream state. They were, you know, John was worshiping. Paul knows exactly when it was. John knows exactly when it was. Um, but they're not the only ones that have, have had vision experiences like this. Go back to Ezekiel chapter 8. So uh, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea. So uh, just uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, just to kind of give you that framework. Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. All right, we're talking about visions here. Uh, this vision John has, this voice that calls him up to heaven. And, and Ezekiel says, in the sixth year, in the sixth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house with the elders of Judah sitting before me, the hand of the Lord God fell upon me there. Then I looked and behold, in a form that had the appearance of a man, below what appeared to his waist was fire, and above his waist was something like the appearance of brightness, like gleaming metal. He put out the form of, the, of a hand and took me by a lock of my head, and the Spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven and brought me in visions of God to Jerusalem to the entrance of the gateway of the inner court that faces north, or the seat of the image of jealousy, which provokes to jealousy. All right, so the idea there is we think about that. Ezekiel was taken up. Was he very lucid when this happened? He was sitting and meeting with some people, right? He knew the exact day and the exact time. Right? This is not a kind of a hallucination that they're kind of trying to vaguely recall later. They were in their right minds and they were very lucid with this when they're taken up into heaven uh, in this. Are they in the body or in spirit or both? I don't know. God knows. 
right? And so how, how that actually took place, were they physically going up into heaven or just spiritually? We don't know. And that's not really the point, is it? The point is they were given glimpses of heaven to bolster their faith or the faith of those that they were talking to, to give a specific witness and revelation. All right. Any questions, thoughts, comments on that? Yeah. So, the, yeah, thanks, Cecilia. The question is, like, how do we know if a vision's from God, or is it people say they have visions? How do we discern, and how do we know? Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. These guys, yeah, these guys weren't inducing their visions. Is one thing, but I think the other thing here is. Um, is it helpful and beneficial to God's people? Is it in line with what God has already revealed? Those are two litmus tests. Go back to scripture, which is, which is cool, right? John is not having anything. We've already seen how some of these images align with other scripture, don't we? John is not having things that are never been talked about or thought about or proclaimed from God before. He's right in line with what God's, and the, even the images are right in line with what God has revealed before. So go back to the scripture, and is it in line with the message of what scripture says? Um, so we need to test the spirits, is what scripture tells us. You know, I, I don't ever want to assume that God can't do something anymore, just because, he, just because it seems that he has it maybe for a while. I don't ever want to assume that he can't. Um, in our tradition, anyways, this is not something that's very strong uh, of having visions. In other Christian traditions, though, it still is strong. Or, um, and often that will come in the form of a dream. Um, these were not dreams. There are other visions in scriptures that seem to be during dreams. These do not seem to be that way. But that's uh, something that I've heard in, in context today and have uh, people talk to me about dreams that they've had where Jesus has appeared to them in a dream. Uh, often you'll actually see this in, in the um, amongst Christians that were formerly Muslim. In many of their conversion experiences, there is a, a dream that they have Jesus appear to them. And it's a confirmation to them that this is the right way to go. Um, and so I, I'm never going to discount the work of the Spirit and how he works and what he can do. But I know for many of us, if not all of us, this is not necessarily something that's common in our experience. Um, but, Cecilia, the question is the right one. How do we know it's from the Lord? Is it in line with Scripture? Um, and it is, um, is it pointing to Jesus in the midst of that. If it's pointing to self or to something else, it's probably not from the Lord. All right, great question. All right, any other thoughts or questions or comments here on this part? All right, we've gotten through like a verse. That's good. All right. Um, um, so now he's going to talk, uh, John's going to describe God. Um, so God is described, he's the one who is sitting on the throne. Um, he has the appearance of Jasper and carnal, uh, carnelian, and um, there's this bow or this rainbow with the appearance of an emerald, right? Um, notice that there's not a description of what God looks like. There, there, you know, John's there, there's not a description of what God looks like. It's describing the effects of things around him. There's this ring of light that's encircling him. There's this brilliance of color from gemstones. But what's the features of God? It's not described. And that's very consistent with every other image, uh, vision of God the Father, right? You think it back to Isaiah's vision that he has uh, when he sees, you know, I was there in the, the sixth year of King Uzziah, or the year King Uzziah died, right, in, in uh, Isaiah chapter 6, 
And he talks about how the glory of the of his robe filled the temple. That's the description we get of the of, of Yahweh there. Right? We talk, he then talks about other things, but this glory, this brilliance, this is what's what this is like. It's um, you can't really look at the Father um, and, and, and tolerate that for very long because of his holiness, his glory, his majesty. It's kind of the same way. You can't look at the sun without it burning your eyes, right? Because it's so bright and so intense. And if you think about the closer you got to that, it'd be even more that way, wouldn't it? Um, but you can see the effects of the sun everywhere. And this is the same way. Yeah. Yeah. Halo. Yeah, this halo, the circle, this iris. Yeah, so you can see the effects of God through the stone. So this idea of this, this rainbow-like bow or halo, uh, the Greek word there is actually iris. So you think about an iris that surrounds your, your eye. Um, and in Greek thought, when they saw a rainbow, they actually thought it was a complete circle, that we just couldn't see all of it. Kind of a cool thing. Yeah, so, so the a rainbow is an iris. Um, and we're just seeing part of it. And so this glory, this majesty completely encircles God. His glory, his majesty is there and it shines forth. And we just can see, John can just kind of describe the effects of it. Uh, and Paul even talked about this, like, I can't even utter in words. I can't, you know, can't even explain exactly what I saw. Um, and every time, so in, in Jewish belief that the... the like us, they see the rainbow from you and they remember the promise that God made never to destroy the whole world again through a flood. But they also see more. It's a signal or a sign of God's creative power and authority over the whole world. And so when they see the rainbow, it not only drives them to remember God's promises, but it drives them in worship and praise and awe for the one who has created all things and is Lord over all things. So this bow is, is part of that as well, this, this rainbow, this halo. Um, and in some, in some things, in some commentaries, I, I read that um, in, at some points in time, because they saw that as a reflection of God's glory, they would not even look at the rainbow. I mean, if it was in the sky, they'd see it, but they wouldn't stare at it because that was God's glory. They would drive them to their knees and worship and praise of God. Uh, kind of an interesting thought. Yeah, Tom? It's interesting when you describe the iris. When we were in Delphi in Greece, which is a holy city among the ancient Greeks, we were out on our balcony with our hotel looking out into the sky, and we saw a rainbow that was almost a complete circle. Yeah, okay. And I, I've never seen a rainbow. Yeah. And I, I'm just thinking when you were saying that, maybe that is something that's unique to those valleys in Delphi. Yeah. And that is a holy area. And yeah. Lord. Yeah. So Tom's describing when he was in Greece that he saw a, a rainbow that was a complete circle. If you have the right vantage point, the right reflections, that definitely can happen. But uh, he was in Greece when that happened and might explain some of those things in that holy area. Thanks for sharing that, Tom. Yeah, so it's uh, an object of worship. Uh, that's Christ, uh, the Lord is being worshipped. Uh, I think most of our say the um, as we will talk in a little bit about this a little bit more. Uh, the precious stones, jasper and sardius. Uh, we know what an emerald is, and some people think they know what the others are, but this is one of those things that it, it's lost a little bit in translation. They are precious gemstones, and I'm sure they have equivalents today but scholars are not united or sure about what those gemstones are. Here's what's interesting though. This is not the first time we've heard these gemstones in scripture. Um, the, the high priest uh, way back in, um, in with, with Moses and Aaron, the first high priest, they, they would wear the, the linen ephod and then they had a breastplate that was made and in the breastplate was inlaid 12 stones, one for each tribe of Israel. And these stones here are three of those stones that are in the breastplate, the high priest's breastplate there, represent the 12 tribes before the throne of God, his, their presence there. Um, and they come and, and 
the priest represents them to the Lord that way. Here, these stones come up again here as well. Um, but again, similar thoughts from Ezekiel and Isaiah. There's no description of, of a face in their uh, visions of God, but there is a brilliant light, light like, a, like a bow, like glowing metal, like fire. Uh, Isaiah talks about how the train of the robe filled the temple, right? So you get this idea of when God's described, it's very consistent um, throughout time and out space um, in, in, in scripture about God is described, All right? Questions, comments, thoughts, interesting facts. And there's a lot there. Yeah, Rob. That's a great way to say that, Ron. We, he, John is not able to, John is doing the best he can to describe these heavenly, otherworldly things in, with pictures and language that you and I can understand, right? It's symbolic, right? Um, so, you know, is, yeah, so the appearance of Jasper, these precious stones that are gleaming and sparkling and light is being reflected off of them. Is that really what's happening? No, that's the best he can do to describe what he's seeing. Right? That's, that's the idea here. And he actually said in verse 3, he said that he who sat there appeared like. It's, it, was it appeared like. Yeah, there's a, a clue that it, this, is, this is the best I'm doing. This is how I'm trying to convey this to you. And so we're going to get to some things later today where things are covered with eyes or horns. Were they literally covered with eyes and horns? No. Those are symbols. And we know what they mean. And so we'll be able to unpack that. So it's not like, oh, that looks really crazy. Yeah, that's not what John's trying to describe the meaning using symbol or picture language the best that he can. All right. Yeah, Mom? Excuse me, kind of correctly, but there's been a few times in my life where I've been somewhere that's just so remarkable and so that there are no words to describe it because it's not just something you visually see, it's the whole experience of how it impacts you. And if you didn't have to write down anything, it would just so lack yeah. in what you saw. The, and I think that that kind of part of it too. The idea when you when you get something new or glorious that if you're told to describe it, it's hard to describe the emotion, the feeling, the surrounding, the setting, and it's hard to put those things into words. Well, that's why we have things like poetry and songs and, and different things that try to not only capture the visual thing of what we're seeing, but also try to capture the emotion and the context and everything else, but done in pictures uh, and different things as well. All right, let's keep reading. Um, is somebody in the room willing to read four through eight of chapter four? I've got a mic for us so that we can hear a little bit better online in the room. Yeah. Thank you. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God, and before the throne there were, as it was, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. All right, great. So we get that refrain again, the one who was and is and is to come. So if you weren't sure who's seated on the throne, now we know. This is the how John described God the Father in chapter one. All right, um, so, so kind of just uh, great things there. So who's seated around the throne? We have uh, the 24 elders on 24 thrones, wearing white, wearing white and wearing crowns. So we'll come back to 
the elders in a minute, but let's see if we can get some clues about who these people are, all right? They're wearing white robes. What does that tell us? They're sanctified, they're righteous, they're holy, made right by Jesus, right? If they're sanctified, who sanctified them? Jesus has, right? They're wearing what on their heads? Golden crowns. They rule. They're given authority to rule and to reign, right? Where have we already seen crowns in Revelation? Last in chapter two, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Yeah, exactly right. Um, in Revelation chapter two, I think nine maybe, um, verse nine, but, uh, or 210. Um, yeah, crown of life. So these are faithful ones, right? They're wearing that crown of life, the crown of ruling. Um, at the end of chapter um, three last week, we talked about one of the promises is that if you're faithful, you will reign with Jesus. He will give you authority and power and dominion. So who are these that are sitting around the crown reign, crown reign, uh, crown reigning with Christ? They're believers. It's the church. Now let's look at the 24 thrones and 24 things and see if we can unpack that a little bit. All right. Um, 24, if we're looking at numbers, that's not a number we see in scripture very often, is it? Is there a number that goes into 24 that we see in scripture a lot? 12, twice, right? 12, twice, 12 times two. All right. So where are some 12s we see in the Bible? What are probably the most significant 12s? 12 apostles and the 12 tribes of tribes. Israel. Yeah, great. Yeah, great, dude. Yeah, 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles, right? The Old Testament, the 12 tribes, that was Israel. Those were the ones that were to follow and believe in God. The New Testament, the apostles, the ones that shared God's love to the, and made Christ known to the peoples. So you have the faithful church of the Old Testament and the faithful church of the New Testament represented by these 12 elders. Um, some have gone in, in throughout history um, and said, well, well, here's who specifically these people are. It's Adam and it's Seth and it's Noah and it's Abraham and it's David and it's Zechariah and it's Stephen and it's James, the brother of Jesus. And it's, I don't think that's what this is, is going on here. This is a representation of all of the faithful people of God. The full number from the Old Testament that believed in the promise of the Messiah and the full number in the New Testament that believe in the promise of the Messiah fulfilled in Jesus Christ. It's the church who are where? Encircled around the throne of God. Complete circle, yeah. Complete circle around the throne of God. We're there. The church is there. The believers of God, the faithful ones, are all around the throne. They reign there because of Jesus. The robe signifies that. The crown shows us that as well. All right. So the current, the total, the totality of the people of God, the assembly of all God's people. And then what comes out of the throne? Thunder and lightning, all right? This is often something that happens with God's presence. You think back to, it's reminiscent of when Israel first comes out of Egypt and are at Mount Sinai. Um, God says, all right, rope off the mountain so no one comes near lest they die. And God begins speaking from the mountain. And at the same time, there is thunder and lightning coming out of the mountain. And the people are like, no, 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 don't have God speak to us directly. Moses, you speak to us for God. But thunder and lightning associated with God's presence and his power, the majesty and glory of God. Again, it's like the sun. You can't look directly at it. You can't get close, but you can see the effects of what happened when God's presence is there. Thunder and lightning and, and all this brilliance and majesty that are there. And so what else is there? You have this seven lamps of fire. Seven spirits. Okay. So let's just take the lamps for a minute. Um, in the tabernacle, 
there was something in the Holy of Holies that lit the Holy of Holies. The menorah, a seven-lighted lampstand, lighting the presence of God. In the presence of God, showing that God's light and his presence were there. In the temple, that same image, that same thing is there. The seven lighted candles of God's presence for his people. And so why else, except around the throne, would we expect of God anything else different than seven lights? God chose to have his name dwell in the tabernacle on the ark. He chose to have his name dwell in the temple. And that presence, the spirit of God's presence was there and shown visibly through these lights. Why else? Why wouldn't they be there now just in a fuller and more magnificent way around the throne, the actual throne of God in heaven, right? And the spirits of God, we've talked about the seven spirits of God, not seven distinct spirits, but the complete, the full spirit of God being the Holy Spirit. Through the light and through the spirit, we see that God's spirit is there uh, throughout uh, um, God's reign here in heaven. All right. Okay. We also see what around the throne? A sea of glass, a crystal sea, right? Um, it's transparent. It's quiet. I, I don't know what your experience is with the sea or with the ocean is. It's, it's not quiet and it's never still. Rarely is there maybe a period, but there's still a swell in it, isn't there? This is a glassy, quiet sea. It separates God from people. Yeah, and there's a separation there that's still taking place in the midst of that. Um, but here's the, uh, here's kind of the, in, in the ancient cosmologies, including Jewish cosmologies and theology, the sea was always seen as chaos, disorder, unrest. All that's wrong in the world comes from this, from the sea, from chaos. But at the throne of God's feet, the chaos has now been brought to order. The unrest now has peace and is quiet and shalom. This is what God does. Later in Revelation, we actually see that the sea is no more because the chaos is completely gone. But it's the same kind of image that God is over it all um, in the midst of that there. So um, holy, 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 that, that great song, that great hymn, right? Holy, holy, holy. Right? Around the glassy sea. Is a line from that song. And maybe like me, you sing that for years and had no idea what that actually meant. But this is where that comes from. This is what that means is that God has, has authority over chaos. He is in control. It is not chaotic anymore because of what he has done. And that's the image that we sing about in that song and that um, comes from this image here that John's writing about. All right. So, right. And then there's the four living creatures. Um, this is where it kind of gets weird, isn't it? <laughs> right. Everything else you're like, oh, that's really cool. I like that. That's great. Now you're like, all right, well, now what's going on? <laughs> all right. This, uh, John doesn't describe them as angels, but that's really uh, very similar to the descriptions of the seraphim or cherubim that are described in Isaiah and Ezekiel's visions as these heavenly beings that are flying around the very inner circle of God. They're closer to, to God the Father than any other being is. Um, they're in the inner circle. They're moving wherever God's desiring them to move. Ezekiel described them um, as having faces, by the way. The same faces that these do, except each one had all four of those faces, which is even a little stranger than this, right? And Ezekiel has them described as um, there's this like chariot or whatever they're guiding this uh, chariot or or a vehicle that has wheels that can move in every direction at the same time. And the idea is these are um, so these are heavenly beings. These are angels that John is describing. 
Uh, the word is uh, comes from our word that we get zoo from. It's so a creature or being. Um, but it can, but John's usage here it's describing heavenly beings, angels that are serving God. And these four um, move wherever God moves. They are present wherever God wants to act and move and go. Um, four of them, the, the coverage of the whole earth, four is the, the number for earth. They completely cover God's reign and dominion. That's there. All right. And so let's describe them a little bit. Um, this could mean animals. Like I said, the word there could mean animals, but in Revelations, it's heavenly beings. Um, Ezekiel 1.10 um, has creatures, four of them, and each of them has the four faces, but each of them has four faces. What's interesting, though, is it's the same four creatures in Ezekiel's vision. Um, there's the lion, the calf, or ox, uh, the face of a man, and an eagle. And as much as, like, commentators throughout history have had to, like, tried to define, like, the 24, who the 24 elders on the 24 thrones are, and you're, like, kind of, like, yeah, that's not really the point I think that John's trying to make, uh, even more, probably, uh, people have been invested in, like, well, who or what's the lion? Who or what's the calf? Who or what's the man? Who or what's the eagle? And there's been some interesting things out there, and, and some of them are like, oh, that's pretty cool to think about. Some have said... Each animal represents one of the different gospels in the Bible, All right? Um, and the only one that they're consistent on talking about is John being the eagle. Otherwise, other commentators, some have, some have uh, Mark being the lion, some have Matthew being the lion, some have Luke being the calf or the ox, some have Matthew being the face of the man. They're not consistent on what they think or why. But there's other interpretations out there, too. Some say, no, each one's describing a specific aspect of Jesus. The, the lion, it's Christ's royal office. The calf or the ox, you know, the sacrifice, it's Christ's priestly character that he sacrificed for us. Um, the face of a man, his human nature as he lived as one of us. And the eagle, the, the gift of the spirit that he gives to the churches. So, so here's, the, here's kind of the thing. I think they're probably in some way, all right. Because the idea of these spirits, these seven creatures, these seven animals, is that they are there serving God to make sure that his will is carried out, that his word is taken to all the people. So would that fit the gospels? Yeah. Would that fit the work of Christ that's gone out into all the entire world? Yeah, and it would fit a whole bunch of other things, too, as this goes that way. The idea is these are God's servants taking his message to all people in the midst of that. But what's their main job? Oh, yeah, go ahead, Ron. Yeah. Yeah, so the idea that the, the way we look at this, it can apply to us in different ways at different times. Yeah, whether, and we don't know, um, we just don't know. And here's the cool thing, All right? Paul wrote 13 of our 27 New Testament books. And there's a lot that we know about God. And there's a lot that God reveals to us in his word. But we just read some verses earlier where Paul says about his own experience I don't know, but God does, right? And those questions about this, the things that we aren't sure about, that we don't know, God knows. And it's not one of those things that's necessary for our salvation to know the specific of that. Do we know that these creatures are serving the Lord, carrying out his will through and out the earth and everything? Yeah. But specifically, we don't know for sure. But as we apply that to our life, it can bring us comfort in different ways uh, to different, different ones of us. All right. Uh, but what are, the, what are these uh, creatures doing? They're always watching and praising, right? They're the choir masters of heaven. Amidst all the other things they're doing serving the Lord, they're leading people in praise of God. And they have eyes all around them. That's really freaky to think about it literally, isn't it? But if you have eyes all around, what does that mean that you could do? 
see everything, see everywhere, right? That's the image John's trying to proclaim, not that the eagle has eyes on its wings literally, right? The, the creature with the face of an eagle. No, it, it's got, John's saying it could see everywhere. Now, how John perceived that or knew that, that's what he perceived or knew in his vision. And this is how he's trying to explain it to you and to me and to his readers. They could see everywhere. They were God's messengers to see all that's going on um, and to lead the praises that's there. They, at this point, they never leave the throne, but, but they go wherever God is, right? So think, we think of the throne so often as a physical location, but the throne of God is wherever God is, isn't it? Right? Wherever God is present, there is his throne. So sometimes we talk about Jesus living in our hearts. Sometimes we talk about how, you know, or two or three are gathered in my name. There am I amongst the midst of them. So they never leave the throne. But does that mean they're only in one location? Now, it's hard for our finite brains to comprehend some of that sometimes. Yeah. They, they are everywhere with the Lord doing his bidding. And they each have six wings. Right? Um, where do we see six-winged creatures? Other in scripture, Isaiah, two they flew, two they, you know, they, two they cover their feet, two they cover their eyes, right? Six winged seraphs, these uh, angels that are there. In Ezekiel's vision, the angels have multiple, more than two wings, but there's, there's four wings in Ezekiel's vision that are there, but they're around the throne attending his presence. All right. Um, Never cease to sing. They are the choir masters of heaven, leading the praise. All right. Um, how about somebody online? Are you willing to read for us verses 9 through 11? I can, Pastor. Thanks, Jean. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Uh, thank you. So, casting down their golden crowns, right, right? Um, hey, this is from here, too. That's pretty cool, right? Yeah. Maybe that hymn writer wasn't very original, right? No, that's the point. They weren't. They were trying to be. They were trying to capture this majesty and glory in the song, Holy Lord. All right. So the response to the winged angels, uh, the winged creatures praise, it's that everyone there falls down and worships. They cross kuneto themselves, is the, the, the Greek word, which literally means they fall flat, they lie prostrate. And if you see the word in Hebrew, that, that's what that means. They cast themselves down. They put their faces to the ground in honor and respect and worship, saying, God, I'm not worthy. Have, do with me what you will, but this is the only response I have. They cast their crowns before him. It's an act of worship because they know that that crown only comes from God and through Christ do they receive anything. And so they know that they're not even worthy to receive the crown, so they lay their crowns before him because they're crowning him with many crowns because he's Lord of all, right? All that good stuff. Yeah, great, great. Um, and what are they praising God for? They're praising God the Father for what? Creating all things. Isn't that what we do, right? I believe in God the Father Almighty for his creative work. It's, it's the, the creed, the, the work of God the Father, his primary work is that of creation, of establishing the world and maintaining it. And so what's the proper response to God the Father? It's praise for his creation, for all that he has done to maintain uh, the works of, of creation. That's the proper and correct response. All right. Um, just going to return back to these, um, the four living creatures for a minute. And I'm going to share my screen here. Um, um, all right. So on my screen there, this is a representation of the Ark of the Covenant. 
And on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant uh, were said, was said to be these winged creature angel things. Seraphim, right? A seraph, that's the singular seraphim, that's the, that's the plural or the, the dual. Um, and there were two of them. Were their wings joined together? That was said to be the mercy seat of God, where God would come and allow his presence to rest. And so when Moses went and talked with God, that's where the glory of God kind of was said to be revealed or thought to be revealed from. On the wings of these creatures, right? That's where the throne of God is. When later Solomon built the temple and he and David worked on the designs of them, um, the ark of God rested in the midst of the Holy of Holies, but on either side of the Holy of Holies were giant seraphim with their wings kind of casting over the ark in the midst of that. And that's where God chose to have his name dwell. Um, and so this image uh, and Isaiah's vision, the seraphim are around the throne and uh, Ezekiel, it's the same thing. So this idea is that this is the, the throne of God is, or on the wings of the seraph. They're moving with him and, and moving, going with him, these four living creatures. That's the presence of God. And it's not a new concept to John in his vision. It's how it's been understood is that the throne of God, the chariot of God, if you will, Ezekiel talks about that a little bit, is on the wings of the seraph. Where God rests, where God sits, where God dwells. And not a new thing that John's having here, but it's in line with how God chooses to reveal himself throughout history, even how he chose to have um, the visible reminder of his presence depicted in art in, in the Ark of the Covenant with the angels on top of the castle. That his throne is on the wings of the seraph. But here it's not just an image. Here it's the actual seraphim is where God is dwelling, ruling. All right. Any thoughts, questions on chapter four? All right. Seeing none, let's keep moving. All right, chapter five. Uh, then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written with, within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. So we'll get to the scroll in a little bit. Um, so questions about the scroll, just hold those for a little bit. We'll get and talk about that in a little bit. Um, but why is John upset? Nobody can open the scroll. And John thinks it's of vital importance that the scroll be opened and read and known. And we'll talk about what that means and is in a little bit. Um, and so who told us, why is he told to stop weeping? Because Jesus can open it, right? The line of the tribe of Judah, the root of Jesse, spoiler alert, that's talking about Jesus, right? Um, those images there are not new images. Uh, the line of the tribe of Judah, these are prophecies about Jesus, who he fulfilled. The, the root of Jesse, the, you know, David's father was Jesse. And so the kingly idea here, these are the fulfillment of God's promises that Jesus has won the victory, right? He's told to stop weeping. This elder points him to Jesus. Isn't that what saints do, right? Saints Point people to Jesus. That's what they do. A saint is, is a believer who has been sanctified, made holy by, by God. 
And the job of a saint is to point people to Jesus. So when people are in despair, we point them to Jesus. When people are struggling, grieving, we point them to Jesus. That's what saints do, is they point people to Jesus. And so the elder has the right response here. John, stop weeping. Go on to try to cure that Jesus is coming. I think it was in more it's Catholic, so but I think the symbolism is still good. I grew up past a church that was the sort of church of St. Mary or the church of the Virgin Mary or something. But on the wall of the church, there was Mary that she's pointing yeah. in front of to Jesus. Yeah. And so she was pointing and she was so so John all right, so Tom saw. Yeah, Tom saw in a Catholic church a picture um, of Mary pointing to Jesus, right? That's the appropriate response for every saint, living or dead, um, right? Is we are to point to Jesus. Where we struggle with our Catholic brothers and sisters is they point to the saints instead of pointing to Jesus, right? We look, it's great to know the saints' lives and how they live, Inasmuch as they point us to Jesus who saved them and redeemed them and inspired them to live the way they did. But as soon as it becomes about the saint, well, now we've got it wrong, right? Because and, and the saints would be upset about that because they know their job is to point people to Jesus. In the Catholic, yeah, because that's not the way, that's not the way that uh, some of the theology has gotten recently in the Catholic Church, at least, uh, and, and has historically been a struggle with. All right, let's keep going. We'll, we'll come back. There's some more to it, but that's the, the first part. Like I said, we're going to come back to the scroll with its seven seals and all those things, but uh, let's keep going, get some more context. How about somebody in the room to read verses six through eight? Thanks, James. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And we had, when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. All right, thank you. All right, so I'll let my prayers rise before you as incense. That's an Old Testament uh, song, that idea that our prayers rise before the throne of God like incense um, as they go to the Lord there. And so the saints there, um, representative of God's people, you know, they have, who are God's people around the throne, those prayers are heard before the throne. Not because the saints carry them there, the elders carry them there, but because the elders are all of the people of God that are gathered there. And so God hears uh, all of our prayers. Um, how is the lamb described? Having been slain, right? Who had been slain, but is standing, right? So alive, looks like a lamb's been killed, but alive. So, so kind of kind of interesting. Even in his glory, so the lamb we know is Jesus. This is not a new kind of image for Jesus. Uh, John the Baptist says, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the sacrificial lamb, the Passover lamb. And that is full of meaning because that's the, the sacrifice that's made or given for God's people. Jesus is that for us. But here, he's the one who, having been slain, is standing in the midst. So even in his glorified state, um, you, we can see his work of salvation that was done, right? So it's pointing to his death on the cross. But because he is standing there, what's it also pointing to? His resurrection. Jesus is alive and glorified. It's not just his death, which he receives glory for, but also his resurrection in the midst of this there. And he is standing there in the midst of the saints, um, What's interesting, we like we talk about um, in the resurrection, we'll have glorified bodies, right? Jesus, after the resurrection, has a glorified body, but he still has the nail marks. Now they're no longer an object of shame. 
they're an object of glory and honor and worship. So what does that mean? And how does that translate for us? We, I don't know. God knows. Uh, I like that. Yeah. Uh, um, but, uh, but will things that we thought were objects of shame and struggle be objects of glory and honor in the new heavens and the earth? Maybe. Will they be completely gone? Maybe. I don't know. God knows. All right. So the other thought or question or do we think? Right. He has them. That might be the same way. Yeah, that, that's been definitely talked about of like, well, what would that look like? But no longer now an object of shame or death. It's an object of glory or honor. That, that very well could be. It is for Jesus. Uh, does that translate the same way for all the rest of us? But he's having been slain now stands alive. It, it shows his redemptive work and his conquering over death. Uh, just in that one kind of phrase uh, that's there. But he's also described now in some ways that maybe are a little more strange. All right, seven horns? Is that a literal seven horns? Probably not. I don't know if God knows. Yeah, thanks for that. It's good. But, but probably not. All right, a horn is a symbol of strength and power. And seven is the, the number for perfection and completeness in God, godliness. So this lamb, what the symbol means is that this lamb has complete and total power and authority. Confirmation class, we had a word for that. Um, omnipotent all-powerful, right? Right? Is that aptly described Jesus? Yeah. Is that, and John's trying to, he, he feels, he sees the omnipotence of the lamb who was slain standing there. How do I convey this to people? Oh, the, ram had, the lamb had seven horns. And now he had seven eyes. You get to that one next. It's seven eyes omniscient. He sees all. He knows all. The all-seeing eye, right? He knows everything. Does the lamb really have seven eyes? Or is this a symbol to show that we have, we don't know for sure, but more than likely, it's a symbol. How do I, like, you ever been in a room with somebody and you just know that they're aware of everything that's going on in the room? Yeah. Right. <laughs> The good, the good ones anyways, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tom, Tom said school teachers. Somebody else said mothers. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, you know, so how do we describe that? What's the phrase? They have eyes in the back of their head. Did they have literal eyes in the back of their head? No, but you could just sense that they could know what was going on in the room. Is this probably what John's describing here with what, the, what he gets from, the, not that the lamb literally has seven eyes on him, but the lamb sees and knows all. Say, <laughs> all right. Uh, and then the, the symbol of, and then the seven spirits, again, the Holy Spirit is with the lamb, doing the work of the lamb as Jesus sends forth the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits, the complete the spirit, the Holy Spirit, the total spirit, sends that out into the world. Jesus is, is has in doing that. All right, so what does, oh yeah, go ahead, Dad. Yeah. Yeah, so Jesus, uh, the Great Commission, uh, my dad was saying, um, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, right? Jesus has that honor and power and authority. And it's great, right? So, they do a worldwide search, but it's bigger than a worldwide search, right? Who's worthy to open the scroll? Anybody in heaven? What about you, Seraphim? Are you worthy? No. What about you, elders? Are you worthy? No. Any saints? No. On earth, anybody around still worthy? Under the earth? This is demonic powers, others, anybody worthy or have the power to open the, the scrolls, the scroll with the seals? No one. Jesus has no rival. 
He has no equal. There is no one else who is worthy or has the power or authority or wisdom or might or strength or anything else to open the scroll. They did the search. There was no one else. No one else. Jesus is given all power and authority. No one else. That should give us confidence. The one who has all power and authority, who has no rival, no equal, is for you and for his church. All right. So um, what does everyone do when the lamb takes the scroll? They fall down and worship the lamb in the same way that they worship the one on the throne. They're, they're the same God. Very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, right? Jesus is God. This is not a, um, there are some that say, well, and we're reading kind of through the uh, Pastor Sutton's book on, you know, why we can trust the Bible. There are some that say, well, this idea of Jesus being God is something that developed way later in Christianity. No, from the very earliest point, Jesus is receiving honor and worship and praise as God, because he is, and he does. Jesus says, I and the Father are one. And what's Jesus' favorite name for himself? Son of man. So let's go and look at that from Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Not the only place this is mentioned, also in Ezekiel, but in Daniel. So we're moving around a bunch in, in scripture today, more than we had the last couple of weeks. Um, so if, keep up as best you can, and if you can, it's okay. You can just listen as we go through these things too. So here uh, in chapter, or chapter 7 of Daniel, verse 13, he says, I saw in the night visions. So could that have been when he was dreaming? Yeah, maybe. We don't know. Um, but it seems to be a little bit different. He says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom and all peoples, nations, and languages to serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. See some similarities here to the throne room of heaven John's seen in his vision? Yeah, maybe Daniel and John are seeing the same event. Just from different vantage points in their vision. Is Jesus given all authority and dominion and power? Yeah. And so when Jesus calls himself the son of man, is that a humble phrase he's using? What's he claiming? All authority and power, dominion over all things, that he has no rival, that he has no equal, that there's no one else worthy but him, right? Um, if Jesus is um, not God, then he's either insane or he's a liar. Those are really our only choices here. I kind of walked through that argument on Sunday about the resurrection, but when Jesus claims about himself, we can kind of do the same thing. Either he's a lunatic or he's a liar or he's Lord. There's really no other options because the same person doesn't claim to have all authority and power in, on, of God if they don't, unless they're lying, right? So he's either telling the truth, he is Lord, he's insane. Um, those are really our only options, or he's lying. Those are the only options we have, um, and we know uh, who he is. And so he can't simply just be a good teacher Right, that's kind of where that argument goes, or a good moral instructor, right? Because if he's a lunatic or a liar, he can't do that. All right. But this, I, I digress. Sorry, I get off on tangents. I, I get myself distracted. It's all right. Um, Jesus is the one with all authority and power. It's the same Son of Man that Daniel saw before the throne of the Lamb, receiving that glory and power. Maybe in a picture of the same event that John is witnessing here, All right? But pretty awesome. Um, so what, um, why is the opening of the scroll important? Well, first let's unpack what the scroll actually is. 
Um, so the scroll, it's written all throughout and all on the back side. Every, page, every part of it is covered with writing. It is complete. It is finished. It is total, right? There's, it's not a fragment. It's not part. And the contents of the scroll are really the messages now um, of Revelation chapter 6 all the way through the end of the book. And what is that? Well, it's the destiny of God's people. It's what happens in history. It's encouragement for the church to remain faithful. It's encouraged and encourage and strength for the church to do what they need to do in their faith. It's the message of the rest of history. And who is given control over it? The Lamb. Jesus. He has authority and power and might over all things, even the rest of history. The psalmist writes, you know, every, you know, the, the days of my life were written, every one of them before they came to be. You know, this idea that God knows what's happening now. Jesus is the Lord of, of history even here too. So remember, only Jesus can receive the scroll. Only Jesus is Lord over its contents. The time from the ascension all the way to the eschaton. Eschaton is that word that means last things or end of days. Um, the destiny of the human race is now under Christ's control. That should give us confidence, even in the midst of struggles. People in John's day who received revelation, they were undergoing lots of struggles. It was encouraging for them to know that Jesus was still in control, even when bad things are happening. Right? Our, our school theme this year is in all things. In all things, God is in control, even the bad. Absolutely. Does that mean the bad things are good things? No, they're still bad things, but God's still Lord over those things too and using them for our good. That's the promise in Romans chapter five, or chapter eight. All right. God works together for all, for good, for um, all, in all things, for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Uh, the Romans, that Romans verse, we know that then in all things, God works together for good. Is that five, eight or eight? 8, 828, thank you. I'm, I'm just, my brain, I saw numbers and my brain just went, I'm like, <laughs> so thank you for the help there. But yeah, um, the other thing this is here is this is the coronation of Jesus. The celebration of Jesus as the conquering hero, the one who is overall and in, in, in all. This is his coronation. As much as his baptism is what's his anointing, this is now his coronation uh, that it's complete. All right. We'll come back to that in just a second. All right. Let's go ahead and uh, I'm going to go ahead and just read to the end of the chapter here. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For when you were slain, for you were slain and by your blood, you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign upon the earth. All right. And then what's described here, I think, is just uh, is John's trying to describe a beautiful musical masterpiece with many layers and everybody singing and praising at the same time. Right. And then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. Same with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Uh, so just want to unpack that a little bit. Um, um, well, before I get that, why is the lamb worthy? The lamb is worthy because his work through his blood. He's the conquering hero. His death, his resurrection, his redemptive work for humanity, right? And because he's made the people of God a kingdom and priests so to share his name. All right. So who praises the lamb? 
everybody everywhere. You know, the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father from Philippians chapter four, right? His praise equals the Father to the, to the one on the throne and to the Lamb. It's there, right? And so, or Philippians chapter two. Um, um, so, um, Yeah, it's for everybody, every tribe and tongue. It's not a, a racial thing. It's not a Jewish thing. It's not a, it's every tribe and tongue. It's not a, a specific language. It's every tribe and tongue. But here's the picture that's there. So there's this new song that's being sung, right, by the 24 elders. The church of God is singing this new song. At the same time, myriads of angels, thousands of angels are singing their refrain around that. So have you ever uh, had a, like, seen a choir or musical piece or maybe been part of that where there's like three or four things going on at the same time? And it's just like, it's hard to take it all in. And at the same time, the seraphim, it, it says they said all oh, men, but really, uh, really the Greek there, the force of that is they kept on saying all oh, men. And so around all of that, you have the seraphim saying all oh, men. Yes, it is so. It is true. It is true. It's there. And so you get this picture of this magnificent praise and celebration of the lamb who was slain and is standing alive and victorious, who has redeemed and conquered and done his work. Yeah, mom? Mm -hmm. Yeah. With angels and archangels. Yeah. 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 If we have this uh, in images in churches, uh, especially in Europe, with the painted uh, ceilings full of angels singing and praising, in our liturgy, where we sing with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and make your glorious name evermore, praising you and singing or saying, "What are we singing? Holy, holy, holy!" Right. This is this image of the heavenly uh, celebration of Jesus. And my congregation pastor described it as, you know, you're not just here and now in this place, but you're caught up with all the angels and archangels and all the saints who ever live. It's so clear. Yeah. Praising We're praising God with all people in all times and all places. It transcends time uh, is what that, that our praises do. And we join with this same celebration. And so is John hearing our voice in this? Yes. Yeah, our voice is one of these voices. That's pretty, that's pretty awesome to think about, isn't it? All right, so when, so we're asking, we're talking about the when. When did this scene take place? Now? In the past? In the future? Right? And I would say all that is true. And I want to add just maybe one more layer to that. Um, Jesus rose from the dead. He accomplished his work of salvation. He appears to his disciples, right? That was part of that Corinthians reading this last week that we talked about. He appeared to Peter and John and to, to, to um, he appeared to the other saints. He appeared to James and he appeared to Mary and he appeared to, 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 um, to hundreds at the same time. And he's with them for how long? 40 days. And, and during that time, they make a trip to Galilee, he gives them the Great Commission, and then comes back to Jerusalem. And on the Mount of Olives, he kind of goes up and it's like, hey, bye. And their, their disciples are staring up into heaven. And the angels say, hey, he'll return in the same way that you saw me go. All right, let's flip that around for a second. Jesus ascends into heaven. He has been gone to earth on his mission. He was sent out on this difficult mission where he has to give up everything. He accomplishes it. He fulfills the Father's will. He ascends into heaven. He comes into the throne room of God, and he's given all authority and power and might. And what's the response? Holy, holy, holy. And everyone bows down and worships. And so... 
I believe what this is describing is the ascension. Right? John's gospel doesn't really talk about the ascension because it's here, right? This is talking about the ascension of Jesus. Sometimes it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, Jesus ascended, great. No, he is sitting in power and might and authority. And that's exactly what this is describing, isn't it? He takes the scroll. He is now Lord of history. He has redeemed history. And now he's now Lord of it as he takes hold of that. And so did that event take place in the past? The celebration? Is the celebration still ongoing? And will it go on forever? Yeah. And so John is taken up into heaven and he sees this ascension party. It is still ongoing. And so that's the idea here. That's what's going on in the midst of this celebration that goes on forever. Jesus is the risen and ascended Lord. And we're not, not sure what that ascension means. You come back and read this passage. And the power and authority and might that Jesus has given because he has ascended and sits at the right hand of God in power and might. All right. And so... Um, so I've heard this uh, reception is kind of like uh, one of the commentators that I read uh, compared it to the, the parable of the prodigal son. Jesus is the son who goes away from the father. And he becomes the most sinful person that ever lived, taking on your sin and mine. The father, you know, he's, he's absent from the father on the cross. He's in the pigsty of the world. And when he comes back to heaven, what does the father do? Throws him the biggest party ever, which is a pretty awesome thing. He's welcomed back in this way. So what does that mean for our welcome into heaven? If Jesus, the most sinful person who ever lived, is welcomed back that way, we, who Jesus has made also sons and daughters of the king, are going to be welcomed back in the same way. Pretty awesome kind of image to think about as kind of just compare those two events and uh, uh, what that looks like. All right. It's kind yeah. of awesome to think about that as a person dies, he's right in the middle of this celebration of grace yeah. for the, you know, all eternity. You know, it's not just an arrival day and I'm going to see St. Peter and, you know, it's... We're already there. And in, in some way, we're already there, you know, in, in, in that idea there for all eternity. All right. Um, so what about John's vision of Jesus or the, this, the vision of heaven that we saw today? What, is, what do you just appreciate? What did you kind of like, wow, that was awesome today just as that opened up for me or I saw these connections. Um, what I want you to do is just at your table for a couple minutes, um, just share on that. Uh, just what did you find just uh, really awesome, intriguing, um, impactful, meaningful today? So share at your table for just a few minutes and then we'll come back and do question 18 together. Um, I'm going to go ahead and break out rooms here online. Uh, so go ahead and you guys can talk about that in your groups. We'll come back in just a minute. All right. So uh, anybody wanted to share uh, something they found it encouraging or awesome or just uh, kind of amazing just as they're talking in your tables, just uh, things from your group. Yeah, well, yeah, we were just talking about how to yeah but yeah this, but this is something different and special that's going on here yeah different and special than our dreams yeah other things that uh that you have that are thinking about or that that struck you yeah tom yeah so the eyes, why John chose eyes, what made him choose eyes to describe that there? Yeah, cool. Yeah, Alan? Mm. Yeah. yeah, so it's the idea that that as John's trying to give us pictures through words and symbols, just the, the amazingness that it's beyond comprehension. Somebody else I was talking with them last night we talked about, isn't it great that we don't understand everything about our God? Because if we had a God that we completely understood, we wouldn't need him anymore, right? 
Um, there's things about the God that we just can't understand or get. Uh, um, yeah, Carolyn. Yeah. So it's not a picture of fearful judgment, but immediate celebration. And that's what we were talking at this front table too, of like, are we, when we step into heaven, are we, do we get, because time is different. Are we, do we see this? Is this our first experience too? You know, are we seated on the thrones and, you know, but is that immediate celebration, not a fearful thing that's there. Um, yeah. I guess some of us maybe expected some kind of intellectual analysis, but he spent a lot of time. <laughs> That's here if you want it, yeah. <laughs> From him, yeah. Talking about Dr. Brighton, I came and spoke at St. John's. Yeah, and, and um, I think that the jaw-dropping awesomeness of Revelation, right? And we see a, a, that picture here. Um, and that's why I took time to unpack a few of those images. Because the reality is, um, that's the message of Revelation, of no matter what we're experiencing right now, the joy, the awesomeness, the celebration of Christ winning and what that means for us. Yeah, there's going to be things that are difficult in our struggles and our bad but that's the, the hope, the message is there. So last question there is, um, how can we point people to Jesus in the midst of despair, just like the elder did, right? The elder pointed people to Jesus. We have people around us in despair. We have people around us that are living without hope, without meaning, without purpose, without joy. Yeah, and what's the role of the elder? To point people to Jesus. To share with them who Jesus is. That can be done through prayer. That can be done as we uh, are presence for them and with them. That can be done as we invite them to be part of our lives or come to, to something that we have going on here. Um, that happens as we live out our everyday lives. Yeah, Carolyn and then Barb. Right. Yeah. So that, that hope is what Carol was talking about. It, it's not a wish. It's a certain hope. We talked about that a lot in Colossians, that certain hope that we have. We can take it to the bank. It's better than any guarantee. It is happening. That's what we have to give in Jesus. Barb? Yeah. Yeah, by, by staying in the word um, and, and by then living that out and sharing that with Great. Um, let's go ahead and close with prayer. I know we're a couple minutes over time here. Sorry about that. Uh, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the blessings that you give to us. Thank you that you are the risen, ascended, victorious Lord and Savior who controls all things. Lord, that we are in your hands, in your care. And so we just trust ourselves, commend ourselves to you this day and every day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, sounds great. We'll see you guys next week. I just encourage you, if you don't have connection with the people that are at your tables yet, if you don't know how to get a hold of each other, if you don't know how to say, if they aren't there to say, hey, I wonder if they're doing all right, let me give them a call. Please do that. Same with you guys online, the same kind of way. Just connect with each other that way as well. Thanks, guys. Great to see you all today. Okay. Jessica. Hey, Jessica. Now, is it next week? That you go you, this weekend. When is your uh, trip? Ne next Friday. Okay. Next Friday. Well, if, if something happens, I don't get to okay. see you. Have a great. Thank you trip. very much. <laughs>